The sun was rising as she led them back the way they had come, past Kali, still slumped asleep on his stump, across the clearing and away. The men were returning, dead branches cracked close at hand, and brush broke with a splashing sound. Once they had to crouch among thorns while two of Kali's weary rogues limped by, wondering bitterly whether the vision of Robin Hood had been real or not. "I smelled them," the first man was saying. "Eyes are easy to deceive and cheats by nature, but surely no shadow has a smell." "The eyes are perjurers, right enough," grunted the second man, who seemed to be wearing a swamp. "But do you truly trust the testimony of your ears, of your nose, of the root of your tongue?" "Not I, my friend. The universe lies to our senses and they lie to us, and how can we ourselves be anything but liars? For myself, I trust neither message nor messenger, neither what I am told nor what I see. There may be truth somewhere, but it never gets down to me." "Ah," said the first man with a black grin, "but you came running with the rest of us to go with Robin Hood, and you hunted for him all night crying and calling like the rest of us. Why not save yourself the trouble if you know better?" "'Well, you never know,' the other answered, thickly spitting mud. "'I could be wrong!' There were a prince and a princess sitting by a stream in a wooded valley. Their seven servants had set up a scarlet canopy beneath a tree, and the young royal couple ate a box lunch to the accompaniment of lutes and therabos. They hardly spoke a word to one another until they had finished the meal, and then the princess sighed and said, "'Well, I suppose I'd best get this silly business over with.' The prince began to read a magazine. "'You might at least,' said the princess, but the prince kept on reading. The princess made a sign to two of the servants, who began to play an older music on their lutes. Then she took a few steps on the grass held up a bridle bright as butter, and called, Here, unicorn, here! Here, my pretty, here to me! Come, 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 come! The prince snickered. It's not your chickens you're calling, you know, he remarked without looking up. Why don't you sing something instead of clucking like that? Well, I'm doing the best I can, the princess cried. I've never called one of these things before. But after a little silence, she began to sing. I am a king's daughter, and if I cared to care, the moon that has no mistress would flutter in my hair. No one dares to cherish what I choose to crave. Never have I hungered that I did not have. I am a king's daughter, and I grow old within the prison of my person, the shackles of my skin, and I would run away and beg from door to door, just to see your shadow once and never more. So she sang, and sang again, and then she called, Nice unicorn! Pretty, pretty, pretty! for a little longer. And then she said angrily, Well, I've done as much as I'll do. I'm going home. The prince yawned and folded his magazine. You satisfied custom well enough, he told her, and no one expected more than that. It's just a formality. Now we can be married. Yes, the princess said, now we can be married. The servants began to pack everything away again, while the two with the lutes played joyous wedding music. The princess's voice was a little sad and defiant as she said, If there really were such things as unicorns, one would have come to me. I called as sweetly as anyone could, and I had the golden bridle. And of course I am pure and untouched. For all of me you are, the prince answered indifferently. As I said, you satisfy custom. You don't satisfy my father, but then neither do I. That would take a unicorn. He was tall, and his face was as soft and pleasant as a marshmallow. When they and their retinue were gone, the unicorn came out of the wood, followed by Molly and the magician, and took up their journey again. A long time later, wandering in another country, where there were no streams and nothing green, Molly asked her why she had not gone to the princess's song. Schmendrick drew near to listen to the answer, though he stayed on his side of the unicorn. He never walked on Molly's side. The unicorn said, That king's daughter would never have run away to see my shadow. 
If I had shown myself and she had known me, she would have been more frightened than if she had seen a dragon, for no one makes promises to a dragon. I remember that once it never mattered to me whether or not princesses meant what they sang. I went to them all and laid my head in their laps, and a few of them rode on my back, though most were afraid. But I have no time for them now, princesses or kitchen maids. I have no time." Molly said something strange then, for a woman who had never slept a night through without waking many times to see if a unicorn was there, and whose dreams were all of gold, golden bridles and gentle young thieves. "'It's the princesses who have no time,' she said. "'The sky spins and drags everything along with it. Princesses and magicians and poor Cully and all. But you stand still. You never see anything just once.' I wish you could be a princess for a little while, or a flower, or a duck, something that can't wait." She sang a verse of a doleful, limping song, halting after each line as she tried to recall the next. Who has choices need not choose, we must, who have none, who can love but what we lose, what is gone is gone. Schmendrick peered over the unicorn's back into Molly's territory. "'Where did you hear that song?' he demanded. It was the first he had spoken to her since the dawn when she joined their journey. Molly shook her head. "'I don't remember. I've known it for a long time.' The land had grown leaner day by day as they traveled on, and the faces of the folk they met had grown bitter with the brown grass, but to the unicorn's eyes Molly was becoming a softer country, full of pools and caves where old flowers came burning out of the ground. Under the dirt and indifference, she appeared only thirty-seven or thirty-eight years old, no older than Schmendrick, surely, despite the magician's birthdayless face. Her rough hair bloomed, her skin quickened, and her voice was nearly as gentle to all things as it was when she spoke to the unicorn. The eyes would never be joyous, any more than they could turn green or blue. But they, too, had wakened in the earth. She walked eagerly into King Haggard's realm on bare, blistered feet, and she sang often. And far away, on the other side of the unicorn, Schmendrick the magician stalked in silence. His black cloak was sprouting holes, coming undone, and so was he. The rain that renewed Molly did not fall on him, and he seemed even more parched and deserted like the land itself. The unicorn could not heal him. A touch of her horn could have brought him back from death, but over despair she had no power, nor over magic that had come and gone. So they journeyed together, flowing the fleeing darkness into a wind that tasted like nails. The rind of the country cracked, and the flesh of it peeled back into gullies and ravines, or shriveled into scabby hills. The sky was so high and pale that it disappeared during the day and the unicorn sometimes thought that the three of them must look as blind and helpless as slugs in the sunlight, with their log or their dank rock tumbled away. But she was a unicorn still, with a unicorn's way of growing more beautiful in evil times and places. Even the breadth of the toads that grumbled in the ditches and dead trees stopped when they saw her. Toads would have been more hospitable than the sullen folk of Haggard's country. Their villages lay bald as bones between the knife-like hills where nothing grew, and they themselves had hearts unmistakably as sour as boiled beer. Their children stoned strangers into town, and their dogs chased them out again. Several of the dogs never returned, for Schmendrick had developed a quick hand and a taste for mongrel. This infuriated the townsmen, as no mere theft would have done. They gave nothing away, and they knew that their enemies were those who did. The unicorn was weary of human beings. Watching her companions as they slept, seeing the shadows of their dreams scurry over their faces, she would feel herself bending under the heaviness of knowing their names. Then she would run until morning to ease the ache, swifter than rain, swift as loss, racing to catch up with the time when she had known nothing at all but the sweetness of being herself. Often then, between the rush of one breath and the reach of another, it came to her that Schmendrick and Molly were long dead, and King Haggard as well, and the Red Bull met and mastered. 
so long ago that the grandchildren of the stars who had seen it happen were withering now, turned to coal, and that she was still the only unicorn left in the world. Then, one owl less autumn evening, they rounded a ridge and saw the castle. It crept into the sky from the far side of a long deep valley, thin and twisted, bristling with thorny turrets, dark and jagged as a giant's grin. Molly laughed outright, but the unicorn shivered, for to her the crooked towers seemed to be groping toward her through the dusk. Beyond the castle the sea glimmered like iron. Haggard's fortress, Schmendrick murmured, shaking his head in wonderment. Haggard's dire keep. A witch built it for him, they say, but he wouldn't pay her for her work, so she put a curse on the castle. She swore that one day it would sink into the sea with Haggard, when his greed caused the sea to overflow. Then she gave a fearful shriek the way they do and vanished in a sulfurous puff. Haggard moved in right away. He said no tyrant's castle was complete without a curse. I don't blame him for not paying her, Molly Grew said scornfully. I could jump on that place myself and scatter it like a pile of leaves. Anyway, I hope the witch has something interesting to do while she waits for that curse to come home. The sea is greater than anyone's greed. Bony birds struggled across the sky, squealing, Help me, help me, help me! And the small black shapes bobbled at the lightless windows of King Haggard's castle. A wet, slow smell found the unicorn. Where is the bull? she asked. Where does Haggard keep the bull? No one keeps the red bull, the magician replied quietly. I have heard that he roams at night and lies up by day in the great cavern beneath the castle. We'll know soon enough, but that's not our problem now. The nearer danger lies there. He pointed down into the valley, where a few lights had begun to shiver. That is Hagsgate, he said. Molly made no answer, but she touched the unicorn with a hand as cold as a cloud. She often put her hands on the unicorn when she was sad, or tired, or afraid. This is King Haggard's town, Schmendrick said. The first one he took when he came over the sea, the one that has lain the longest under his hand. It has a wicked name, though none I ever met could say exactly why. No one goes into Hagsgate, and nothing comes out of it but tales to make children behave. Monsters, werebeasts, witch covens, demons in broad daylight, and the like. But there is something evil in Hagsgate, I think. Mommy Fortuna would never go there. And once she even said that Haggard was not safe while Hagsgate stood. There is something in there. He peered closely at Molly as he spoke, for it was his one bitter pleasure these days to see her frightened in spite of the white presence of the unicorn. But she answered him quite calmly, with her hands at her sides. I have heard Hagsgate called the town that no man knows. Maybe it's a secret what's waiting for a woman to find out. A woman and a unicorn. But what's to be done with you? Schmendrick smiled then. I am no man, he said. I am a magician with no magic, and that's no one at all. The foxfire lights of Hagsgate grew brighter as the unicorn watched them, but not even a flint flared in Haggard's castle. It was too dark to see men moving on the walls, but across the valley she could hear the soft boom of armor and the clatter of pikes on stone. Sentinels had met and marched away again. The smell of the red bull sported all around the unicorn as she started down the thin, brambly path that led to Hag